All right, folks. Prior to today, we had announced that this conversation was going to be um, largely about the Southern uh, impoundment and what we know from the 30% design report regarding the plan to remediate the Southern waste pit. And um, before we get into that, I wanna go over a couple of other items. Okay, um, first and foremost, uh, just doing some quick housekeeping. Um, I want to remind everyone to please be respectful of other people's opinions, feeling, and time. And I'm going to um, do the same. And we scheduled this meeting to be one hour and I intend to have you all um, off of this Zoom uh, within the hour. And uh, we will open this up at the end of the presentation to Q&A. And so if you are the kind of person that thinks of things and you might forget your questions, then please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, we would be happy to uh, keep track of those as they come through um, during the presentation and then those will be answered at the end. Okay, so um, I know some of you were here with us for the design update for the northern impoundment. Um, we've also discussed the sand separation area and um, the really startling update we had there time-wise was that uh, this, the project timeline has shifted from what we understood in the record of decision for about two, two and a half years for remediation of the northern impoundment to seven years for the northern impoundment. And uh, the timeline for the southern impoundment is um, around a year. I've, I've seen a little less than a year and I've seen a little over a year. So I'll just say a year, give or take, um, according to the ROD. And then currently the EPA is co coordinating with numerous agencies to do the design work. Um, you know, with Superfund, many of us on this line know that um, if there are parties found to be responsible, they fund and commission and execute all of the work that's done, all of the research that's done at the site under EPA oversight. And um, these groups you see here, these agencies you see here listed on the screen are part of what one of the big updates today was about. Um, so the EPA has a technical working group that they have set up for the um, technical items of the design phase and for the construction plans for remediation. And those groups have been meeting um, every month working on the fine details. And um, that is made up of EPA, the responsible parties, TCEQ, the Army Corps of Engineers, and some other technical folks. However, many of the other entities on this list right here that the agency is coordinating with like our local government, um, have not been a part of those technical working group meetings. Okay. So the major updates that we received today both tie into that slide that we just discussed. Um, the EPA sent out a email, an email this morning from Gary, the remedial project manager. And Gary sent the email out to the community advisory committee or the CAC, which myself and um, some of our THEA team members are on. And um, this email notified us of these really, these two big updates. And one is that the responsible parties consultants had written the EPA on behalf of the responsible parties asking for a 160 day extension to the design process for the northern impoundment. I have inquired to the agency for clarification if this is in fact just for the northern impoundment or if it might impact the timeline for the other areas. Um, I haven't heard back yet. Um, so this 160 day extension is not something that I believe community members will be excited to hear. Uh, I, you know, my first response was just figuring out, okay, 160 days, how, you know, in, in months, how much more time does that give us? You know, what does that look like? And thinking through the issues that we have 
observed with the design process so far and all of the concerns that we've had and lack of confidence that we've had in the direction that this design is going. And so um, he, first hearing the extension, I thought, you know, this actually might be what's needed. More time to do due diligence now on the front end um, prior to starting the construction. Um, and then regarding the EPA request for the technical work group amendment, what that is about. So when the EPA negotiated with the responsible parties to enter into the design phase, there was this thing called the technical working group in the contract. And that required TCEQ, the Army Corps, EPA, the responsible parties and their consultants to meet on a regular basis to discuss the design details and the work progress um, as they move through the design phase. However, what was missing from that technical working group or TWG was the local government. Um, that agreement between the EPA and the responsible parties did not require the responsible parties to have Harris County or the Port of Houston be a part of that technical working group. So where their place to date has been in this design process is prior to any of the studies um, or, you know, major milestone items going public, um, when they hit those major milestones or complete a study, then Harris County and the Port of Houston typically have the opportunity to review the technical material and submit comments prior to it going public. And then those comments are taken into consideration. And so the EPA, along with Harris County and the Port of Houston have been asking to have, for the two local entities to have a seat at the table. And it has been rejected to date by uh, the responsible parties. And so um, I remember, you know, the last um, community advisory committee meeting we had in person, which was February of this year, the um, director of Harris County Pollution Control was like, you know, it would be really great if we could get it approved to be in those monthly meetings and be involved in this process prior to a major milestone being produced. Because if they were able to be a part of the process as they were going through the process, it just seems like it would be streamlined, it would run smoother, it would be more time effective. And um, so in this letter that the EPA sent us today, uh, which is the letter they sent to the responsible parties and the consultants, you know, they made a strong case for the need for Harris County and the Port of Houston to be a part of this technical working group and to be allowed to be a part of these monthly meetings. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think this is important. I think that some of the things that have caused this extension could have totally been avoided, um, had more technical eyes and greater objectivity been a part of the Superfund process. So let me read to you the three things that Gary, the remedial project manager said in his email were the reason for the 160 day extension, which by the way, then brings the um, deadline for the design for the Northern impoundments to April 22nd of 2021. All right, one, the receipt of certain technical information and information about plans being developed by other state and federal agencies that is necessary to be completed for the remedial design. So simply a need for more information. Um, the respondents to determine if significant concerns about constructability of the best management practices and other aspects of the design as described in the Northern Impoundment, 30% remedial design can be resolved. And three, to account for overall inefficiency introduced to the design process due to work restrictions in response to the coronavirus pandemic. I'm a little confused about that third point because my understanding was they kept rocking on and kept working during the pandemic. Um, they just weren't always able to be on site. So uh, I'm not really sure what the hangup is there. It might have been, you know, 
personnel being able to be on site at the same time. I'm, I'm really not sure um, what, the, you know, what the exact hang up there was. My understanding was we were good on that one. Um, but the first two I fully agree with. I want to read you my response. Gary, while I will never be a fan of the waste being in the river, I support the extension and I fully understand the need for more time to get things right on the front end. The surrounding communities want this process to continue moving, but they also want confidence that remediation is going to utilize the absolute best management practices and technology to ensure the work is done safely and effectively. We are all relying on you, the US EPA, to hold polluters accountable and ensure this cleanup is done right the first time. Too much is at risk, public health, the environment, and the aquatic ecosystem of one of the most fertile bays in America. One thing I want to clarify, that the design schedule for the Southern impoundments has not been altered. From the CAC presentation, my understanding is the pre-final deadline is this month and the final deadline is in November. This is for the Southern impoundment. We have a couple of items we are concerned about and intend to address with the EPA regarding the 30% design for the Southern impoundment. Regarding the EPA's position on adding Harris County and the Port of Houston to future technical working group meetings, I fully support and appreciate the agency's position. It appears that the local government having the ability to provide Feedback and input through the monthly working group meetings could only improve the process and potentially prevent further delays. It is known that the communities around the San Jacinto River waste pits have abnormally high rates of cancer and children and people of all ages. We want to minimize the long-term potential for this waste to enter the environment, whether locally or where this waste is disposed of once it is removed from the river. At the end of the day, I hope that all stakeholders can walk away from this remediation proud of making Harris County and Galveston Bay a safer place. Okay, so that is the email, uh, yeah, the email that I submitted to uh, Gary, the remedial project manager, and all of the CAC was um, CC'd on that email, which includes, you know, responsible parties, um, their consultants, various agencies within the government um, and other stakeholders. So, um, you know, I wanna go through a couple of items here that, that some of you that are on the line right now haven't seen. I know some of you are aware of these issues, um, but why I support the extension. Um, okay, so what you're looking at right now is the approach for the northern impoundment in the 30% design. So you're looking at an aerial view of that northern pit, and the dotted outline is the site perimeter. You'll notice five different colored cells within that, and then the area um, around the north and uh, north northeast to, to due east is the same color as the river. And that's an area that they're saying, the responsible parties consultants are saying, does not actually need remediation because all of the uh, waste or material that's in that area is actually below the remedial cleanup goal of 30 parts per trillion. So what we learned in this design investigation, the first phase and the second phase was that these cells are so much deeper than we originally understood. Um, one of them in cell two is actually, um, I believe just over 30 feet deep. So when you're looking at driving in uh, sheet piling to the riverbed and you're going to be holding back the river water on one side and protecting the waste on the other, you're gonna have construction workers in there dewatering the site and excavating the waste material. There's one, a huge safety issue at hand for the construction worker, um, but also for the river. And so um, that's part of what led to this different five cell approach is isolating it in smaller um, compartments to be able to handle, um, you know, the engineering and construction and design for the varying depths. And so they were kind of grouped together based on um, the depths and the approach that was gonna be needed to safely get in here and get this stuff out. Okay, so following our review of the 30% design, and um, what I discussed with y'all at the last 
virtual Zoom was our call to action and the need for more sampling to be done for the waste classification or characterization to be redone because what has been done can give us no confidence that the waste was adequately classified and that what was sampled and analyzed was in any way representation of the actual waste that's going to be removed. Um, so we are also, you know, leaning on the agency pretty hard these days for integrity, transparency, and trust. And as I said in that letter, we're relying on them to hold the polluters accountable. All of us are relying on them. And, you know, one thing that I've always tried to drive home for all of us is to remember who the target is and remember that the EPA is not the target. You know, the EPA is the entity that we may not agree with everything on, but we have to figure out how to work with them because at the end of the day, they have the ultimate authority of what goes on at this site. And so we need them. Uh, you know, the companies that are involved didn't just wake up one day and decide they were going to make right at this site. They were federally forced into this remediation process. So um, we need to figure out a way to continue um, moving this process forward, using our voices to the agency, and um, you know, serving as that watchdog role that we do to look for things in the technical arena and in the various arenas that are involved in this process. So I know what you're looking at right now is like is a lot. Um, okay, so first I'm going to go to the right side of the screen, um, and this ties in again to just why the waste characterization needs to be redone, why I support the extension, because more time needs to be done to get this right. What you're looking at um, on the right, again, is that northern pit. And the purple, red, and yellow icons there are points that were sampled for the waste characterization. If you remember on that image I just, or the map I just showed with the different cells, the different colored cells, that outer buffer to the north, northeast, and east is that area that the responsible parties consultants say don't, re don't contain waste material above, um, above the cleanup goal and therefore don't need remediation, yet that is where 85% of the samples came from. So, um, you know, if I will, well, I'll, I'll just stop there. So um, we need that redone. We need these samples to be representative because at the end of the day, the way that the waste is handled on site, the way it enters our roadways and the way it is disposed of indefinitely depends on this part of the process. It's critical. We have to get it right now. We have to protect our communities, the river, the aquatic habitat, um, the road, what, what, it could encounter on the roadways, the construction workers, the truck drivers, the people working at the facility it goes to, and the people who live where it's going. Um, also, uh, another reason why we've called for the waste classification to be redone. Um, this is a page out of the lab report for the waste clarification. I'm um, sorry, classification. And you can see here, I've highlighted the note at the top. I've I've uh, zoomed in on it. And so uh, it says here, note per the client's request, sample number, sample number uh, was received, was removed from this report and the TEQ summaries have been removed from this report. So uh, there was no explanation for that. We're still waiting on an explanation. Uh, on another page in that same report, it says, note, this report has been revised to report only the dioxin and metal results per the client's request again, with no explanation of why data was requested to be removed. That's not normal. It's not normal, folks. Okay, so we have to, you know, do everything we can to make sure that this process is, is done right. And, um, you know, looking back at the similar Superfund sites across the nation, the ones that have made it to their five-year review many of them have needed more remediation. Why? Because the work wasn't done right on the front end. They didn't get it all during construction. And so we need to make sure that that doesn't happen here. And like I said in the email to Gary and the entire CAC, this has to be done effectively the first time. Uh, you know, we're, we're not interested in seeing this, you know, seeing construction done again in five years. The community is not interested in 
dealing with that, you know? So it's already gonna be a really big burden on the communities, those who live closest by, those who travel Interstate 10 across the river, um, east and west. And so we've gotta make sure um, that we get it right. And so we're asking you to help us help you. Uh, I have an image here, one uh, taken from, uh, taken in 2010. And that was in the earlier years of investigating at the waste pits. And what you're seeing there is actually the waste material. It's nasty, gunky, sludge-like stuff. Um, and then on the left hand is just simply uh, some letters, some mass mailing that we've done before to the agency. And that is what we need your help with. Um, our power is people power, right? And so elevating your voices is part of what makes this process better. And so, um, you know, we did a really, really good job at submitting tens of thousands of public comments during the proposal, or I'm sorry, during the comment period on the record of decision. And we've got to keep that up. You know, we've, we have to keep um, the community, the public using their voices. So um, Tracy should be dropping a link in the chat. Please go by our um, website and or you can follow the link or go to our website <clears throat> and um, find and you'll, you can find the letter there. We're asking you to sign it if you support the position and um, help, you know, keep this process uh, moving in the right direction. All right, so now we are going to talk about the um, Southern Impoundments. And this is the cover page from the Southern Impoundments um, from, from their 30% design. And what my, just distracted my mind when I was speaking just now is uh, that all you see here is International Paper Corporation. On the Northern Impoundments 30% design cover page, it's International Paper and Mimic. And um, I asked the EPA about this in the last CAC meeting, which was a couple of months ago. And, um, you know, they said that they needed one responsible party to get the work done. And that is IP. Um, so, you know, that's the explanation I got. I think that, you know, we're going to see some stuff as we go through um, some more of the details with this Southern impoundment that, that might, you know, make us question kind of what all went on at that site over time. It's uh, it's kind of interesting, some of the things that they have found. Okay. So we are looking at an overview of what is known as the San Jacinto River Waste Pits, super fun site. In green, we have the Northern Pit. You know, most often when we talk about the waste pits and when we just typically say waste pits, we're almost off, we're almost always talking about that Northern Pit because it is in the river, literally in the river. Um, but there's also two other problematic areas. We have the Southern Impoundment or the Southern Pit, which you see there highlighted in yellow. And then we have the sand separation area, which has the um, pink lines on it just northwest of that northern pit. All right. I want to go through some of the details that we've learned from the rod and or the record of decision is the rod and through this design process. So the risk based cleanup level for the southern impoundment is 240 parts per trillion. And so this cleanup goal is based on a construction worker exposure scenario. And um, they've only considered uh, in the rod and therefore subsequently in this design to go down to 10 feet. So they are um, looking at, you know, occasional construction workers that might come onto this property to dig a ditch, some sort of trench. Um, you know, there's a couple of different um, boat facilities and um, I'm sorry, barge facilities that are on the Southern impoundment. So, you know, they're looking at that protective level for an occasional person entering that site. All 
Okay, sorry, this is a lot of text, but I just, I feel like it's important for us to be able to wrap our heads around, you know, what the goals are at the Southern site, because the two sites are vastly different. Yes, they both have very high concentrations of uh, very um, toxic substance known as dioxin, uh, more specifically TCDD. That is the congener that is, is incredibly toxic in small doses. And so seeing what, you know, some of the goals are for the remedial action at the sites is important. Um, okay, so the remedial action objective uh, first is to prevent releases of dioxin and furans above cleanup goal from the former waste impoundments to sediment and surface water of the San Jacinto River. That's important. I should have put that one in red also. Really important. Okay, the second is uh, the re remedial action objective two is to reduce human exposure to dioxins and furans from ingestion of fish by remediating sediment to appropriate cleanup levels. I find the word sediment interesting. So um, just a little caveat. Sometimes you will see soil and sometimes you will see sediment and what's the difference? So soil is what we have in, you know, backyards, what we have on the river banks. Um, it is above water. And sediment is what is under the river water. It is what is under water. So um, that's the difference in sediment versus soil. So it says there, by remediating sediments to appropriate cleanup levels. Remedial action uh, objective three, reduce human exposure to dioxins and fur furans from direct contact with or ingestion of paper mill waste, soil, and sediment by re remediating affected media to appropriate cleanup levels. Number four, reduce exposures to benthic invertebrates, birds, and mammals to paper mill waste derived dioxins and furans by remediating affected media to appropriate cleanup levels. So this is really important for our food for thought as we move forward. Okay, so right now we are looking at the overview of the areas at the Southern Impoundment that are planned to be remediated within that dotted line. So, okay, so here's the catch. So the Southern Impoundment is within the, that black dashed line and um, that entire area is not going to be remediated. And the areas to the southwest, the green and yellow, just outside that dashed line, the agency is not looking to remediate. So that's kind of where some of the issues come in. Um, looking at these areas, um, the agency has identified them as the highest concentrations of dioxin. These are the areas with concentrations of TCDD above that cleanup goal. And so um, the varying colors you see here on the map don't have to do with concentration of contamination. Those actually have to do with depth. And so the dark green is four feet below ground surface. The lime green is six feet, the yellow is eight feet, and the red is 10 feet. Meaning you have to go all the way down to 10 feet to actually hit waste material above 240 parts per trillion. However, um, I wanted to be sure that I pointed out that there are some really, really hot spots here. Um, at the Northern Impoundment, the, the greatest concentration of TCDD I have seen is 96,700 parts per trillion. Right over here, you should be able to see where my arrow is, um, in this red little polygon, at 10 feet below ground surface, they picked up levels of TCDD at 152,000 parts per trillion. That's astronomical. That is incredibly high. Um, so, you know, I, I just firmly believe we have to make sure that they're doing their due diligence now, and the rod only required them to go down to 10 feet. But that polygon there is showing us at 10 feet, they have 152,000 parts per trillion TCDD. So I wonder what's at 11 feet. Um, this stuff has been there for decades. And um, I'm really concerned about what could be deeper, not necessarily because 
right now it's in contact with the river, but we know that at that depth and storm conditions, the river can absolutely be in contact with the groundwater that is at that depth. Um, and it being in contact with the groundwater alone is, is you know, definitely room for concern. Something else we've seen uh, that we need to talk with the agency to understand further is that um, core samples actually showed um, types of debris that they thought, well, this is not typically associated with paper mill waste like um, asbestos and hydrocarbons. And so during this design investigation, they tested for total petroleum hydrocarbons and asbestos, as well as some other types of chemical compounds that could be associated with um, the type of debris that they were finding when they were doing the investigating. And so um, there is a sample that's located, I believe right in here, that um, they found slightly elevated hydrocarbons. So I'm really interested in how the agency is planning on tackling this beast because hydrocarbons are quite different in how they react in our environments than dioxin. Um, so that's something that I will definitely have to keep y'all posted on in the future. Oop. Sorry about that. Meant to take that one out. Okay, um, actually, let me go back two slides. Okay, so I want you all to look down here towards the bottom of the screen. And um, towards that bottom of that dashed line, you can see um, that there is a road, you know, coming in off of market, and then you can enter uh, the shipyard here. And then there's a road here that comes over to some buildings that are under these colored polygons. And some of those uh, facilities are gonna have to be torn down in order to remediate this waste material that's underneath them. Um, however, what's just over here outside of these dashed lines, the agency's not looking at remediating. And so, um, you know, I, that baffles me a little bit because this is a, an ambiguous dotted line, right? This isn't a, a real line out there, you know, on the ground. This is something that was drawn by the EPA to focus their investigation on during this Superfund process. And so they've required sampling outside of this line, but they're not going to require anything to be done about it, even though they found high concentrations of waste material outside of that dotted line. So it doesn't make any sense to me. And then you'll notice that um, right here, it's, it's directly adjacent to the river. I mean, it is where the edge of this peninsula meets the river. And so um, I think that's where the term sediment comes in. That's the only justification I can find with, or I can come up with, with them continuing to mention in the goals the term sediment. You know, they, they say here in remedial action objective two, um, by remediating sediment, sediments to appropriate cleanup levels. And then here, number four, reduce exposures of benthic invertebrates, uh, birds and mammals to paper mill waste, derived dioxins and furans by remediating affected media to appropriate cleanup levels. That's where the benthic vertebrates are going to be is in that area. Um, also, we know that this area has very heavy barge traffic. So, I mean, look right here. You see all of this is tilted. You see all of these barges lined up right here. What happens if one of those were to crash into the that portion of the peninsula? Our community members for years have been concerned uh you know about the potential for a barge to strike the northern pit that happened that happened in imelda not only did a barge in tropical storm imelda strike the northern impoundment it then grounded on the northern impoundment meanwhile two barges struck interstate 10 this is a very very real problem a valid concern that's been realized so um we're really concerned about that so I wanted to go ahead and zoom in on that facility that I mentioned here um, that is part of 
uh, you know, the uh, Kirby facility that is just at the end of Market Street. So um, here you enter the Kirby facility from Market Street, you hang a right, and then you can access this, well, we can't, private property, but um, this road here is accessible. And it actually goes out onto the hot spots of the waste pits. And um, you can see here, there's um, lo what looks like some facilities here, here as well, as well as here. And so the record of decision notes that um, there's cement slabs and building structures that will have to be torn down for this remediation to take place. Um, you know, I, um, I think it's unfortunate. I mean, it's absolutely unfortunate that these businesses have to be disrupted. But um, then again, you think about the employees of those businesses and uh, what it's like for them to have to be on top of that ground day in, day out, or if they're an, an occasional worker. Okay, so let's talk about moving forward. And then we can, um, we'll also note in here how this new information we just received today is going to impact this process. Okay, so the pre-final design is um, to be submitted to the EPA for the Southern Impoundments this month. Um, so it's so important that we are advocating to the agency, we're advocating to them in a timely fashion. The letter that we currently have on our website is only regarding the northern pit and the call for integrity. So um, we are absolutely going to be updating that, uh, likely within about a week's time to include some of these newer points. Um, and then the updated pre-final design to be submitted to the EPA is for the northern impoundment is April of 2021. And I believe that date that Gary had in his email was April 22nd of 2021. So, you know, we're talking a couple of seasons and between now and then. Um, but I think that, you know, it's important to make sure this is done, this is done right and that no stone is left unturned, unturned right now. Um, so for the final design, the final design documents are supposed to be handed over to the EPA from the responsible parties contractors um, for the Southern Pit in November of this year. And then we don't have a date for the Northern Impoundment. Um, so kind of what happens between that pre-final and that final design is, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the technical working group, the local government, um, having the ability to digest the information, submit their thoughts and comments. And so, um, you know, during that time, there's a bit of back and forth between um, the, responsible parties, the consultants, and the EPA, and really working out the final details to get those final design documents. So there's a chance that we could have the final design for the Southern impoundments um, by the end of this year. All right, folks, um, now I will open it up to questions, concerns, comments. Um, and in the chat box, um, we will drop the link to uh, our letter of support that we are asking that you please take a couple of minutes to sign. And then also um, earlier, you know, when I read my letter to Gary, I asked uh, or I mentioned that it's known that there are abnormally high rates of cancer in the communities around the waste pits. And so um, we have been collecting health data uh, for quite some time to gain a better understanding of the health of the community because um, what our government agencies have access to is fairly limited. And so um, if you have filled out a health survey, but you have updates to or changes in your health, we're asking that you please update the health survey with us. Um, and if you haven't filled one out, please take, uh, you know, five, 10 minutes of your time to fill out the health survey on our website. Um, if uh, you're on the line, but not on Zoom and you can't access the chat, you can go to our website, www.txhea.org, go to the programs tab and the community health survey. And um, we, worked with Texas Department of State Health Services. Gosh, it must have been five years ago by now. Uh, I think it was five years ago. Um, it seems like yesterday, but um, 
the cancer registry that they retrieve the information from on cancer rates has so much more information now in 2020 and um, maybe even more next year. And so um, it typically lags behind, you know, a year to three years. And so anyways, even though it lags behind, we will still be able to see several more years of updated cancer rates in the event that we work with them again on cancer rates. And that's what we intend to do. Um, we're putting the word out now for folks to come uh, come to our website, fill out these health surveys so that we can then talk with the agency, uh, Texas Department of State Health Services about doing a fresher look at the cancer registry um, for the surrounding communities. All right. Okay, um, so now we are going to uh, take questions. I have a question here from Gil. In the Southern Impoundment, why were no samples taken on the east edge of the site across the access road from where samples were taken? Can we be sure no waste material is under and around those buildings? All right, so here's what I'm going to do, Gil. I am going to share my screen again so I can pull that back up. Okay, um, Gil, do you have the capability to unmute yourself? Ah, oh, there you are, Gil, all right. Okay, Gil, so um, you are talking about when you're saying, how do we know for sure nothing's under those facilities? So you're talking about um, the shipyard between the river, the main river channel and market. Exactly. Okay, okay. So let me go to, this map here i'm just gonna is it is it okay for y'all to view gilbert is is that okay for you to view this on its side or is it confusing that's fine okay right, so I'm the area at the top all those buildings and parking lots and open land how do we know that that wasn't a waste pit dump also right so if you look at historical photos from about ironically right in here you know, from, so I'd say over, so about two thirds of the land within this dashed line, you can see it's a black lagoon. It, it's a black lagoon. It very much looks like a waste pit. Um, then when the pit was full to capacity, they came in and put clean fill on top of it. And eventually, uh, you know, enter these businesses. Businesses, you know, land was sold, land was purchased, businesses came in, built their facilities. Um, so I found a map earlier that actually had come in, um, an investigation area. It showed the early investigation area for this site. And it went across the road and over here. But what I don't know is why for these facilities that are here, hidden under these polygons, where they are telling us there's contamination, so much so that those buildings are gonna need to be torn down. Cement slabs tore up. Um, how, what, what took place there that maybe didn't take place up here to give us that look under the facilities here on the Southern Peninsula, because um, you know we, we have a technical advisor at Thea that I've been working with and him and I were looking at this and we're like, you know, these lines, it's just, um, it's really difficult to believe that construction just stops at these like perfectly straight lines. And, and that's what you have right here, right? You have at this, at this facility, um, 
according to the EPA, or, or I'm sorry, the responsible parties consultants, um, under EPA oversight, you have a perfectly straight line stopping right here. And if you drive down this road, or if you look at Google Earth, that is a carport, I believe. So folks are parking right there. And so um, I, I think it is questionable that, you know, we're to believe that it the, con the contamination stops at a, a solid straight line. Um, I definitely think, you know, more question needs to be asked about how they are delineating these different areas. Um, I have read a bit about how, uh, you know, when they found a boring of contaminated with contaminated material above that cleanup goal, they would then, uh, you know, go out in specific intervals, like two foot intervals and go out from there to delineate. So there has been a substantial amount of sampling that between the remedial investigation, the uh, pre-design investigation one, and pre-design investigation phase two, that has taken place around here. Um, but we definitely need to inquire uh, with the agency about um, what gives them confidence that it's not contaminated under this land. All right. Okay, folks, um, does anyone else have any questions? There's a question from David Hala. Is it in the chat? Yes. Uh, could you read that to me? I'm not seeing it. It says one of the objectives stating reducing human exposure to dioxins from fish shellfish consumption. Is there much known about levels in these organisms from this area? Is there any continuous monitoring of levels in fish and shellfish? Great question. Uh, there's not enough monitoring, I'll tell you that. Um, the first fish consumption advisory that was issued in this area was in 1990. And um, all of the uh, advisories for fish consumption come directly from the Texas Department of State Health Services. A lot of people think that they would come from Parks and Wildlife because that's who issues the licenses, um, but they actually come from the State Health Department. And um, those advisories have shifted slightly through the years, but they have really remained steady for PCB and dioxin contamination in the aquatic species. So um, as of right now, most of the local waterways here are under an, a consumption advisory. Um, that advisory is for um, women of childbearing age, children and children to consume no locally caught seafood. That's any type of fish or crab are not to be consumed from this area. You know, and what I think of that is like driving without a seatbelt. Um, it's just not safe. Um, and we, we, we know better by now. Um, and that's really kind of what the exposure to these harmful chemicals is, is we know better. And so um, there are advisories in place. And then folks uh, like the elderly or folks with a compromised immune system should not consume um, any locally caught seafood either. You know, men have kind of skated through the advisory and that's for uh, a couple of reasons. One, uh, they're not the one that carries the babies, although they're very much a part of that process. So um, that's never made too much sense to us. Um, and then the this um, dioxin is something that can stay in your genetic makeup for up to seven generations. So um, it is it can be passed from the mother's breast milk to the baby. And so uh, that is another part of why women of childbearing age are under that advisory to not consume any locally caught seafood. Um, this, these chemicals can stay in one's 
body for, you know, it, it varies. There's a lot that comes into play, genetic metabolism, uh, fat content. Um, but at the end of the day, all of our organs are lined with fat and, um, dioxin likes to, uh, go into the nucleus of our cells. It also likes to go into our fat cells. And, um, and so, um, it's important that children for developmental reasons, as well as, you know, later on reproductive reasons, not consume any locally caught seafood. Um, now, the testing that has been done regularly um, has found that 97% of the seafood that has been tested in local waterways is contaminated with unsafe levels of dioxin and PCBs. There's not enough testing though. Um, back almost 10 years ago now, when I first got involved with this super fun site, a lot of the testing to date that had been um, done was on species like uh, hard-headed catfish. They weren't really testing uh, some of the more delicacy type items that our region is known for, um, like the crab and like flounder. And so testing since has been done on those species, but it's not regular. Um, Harris County, uh, the local precinct did issue, a, did award a grant to uh, a collaboration between Galveston Bay Foundation and the University of Houston to do more testing since the state simply isn't doing enough. And um, I've, I haven't seen the reports from that yet. I don't believe they've been published because I'm, I've been a part of um, reviewing things during that process of the collaboration. And I haven't seen any results produced or any type of report produced. Um, so, you know, that's something that we're very much interested in. Um, the advisory was updated fairly recently, and it is all tributaries north of 146 are under this advisory. Thank you for that question. Very important. Oops, just trying to get my, there it is. Ah, ah, okay, there's the chat. Okay, so I see that's the one only question I see in there so far. All right, any, let me check the time. Any other questions, thoughts? Um, I'd be curious, you know, to hear from our community members, Gil, anybody uh, on here, you know, that kind of what your thoughts are and what your feelings are on this, um, this new update that we got today on the extension or uh, the technical working group. Hey, David Kennard, thanks. <laughs> Good to see you. All right, feel free to interrupt me. Um, but since I haven't heard from anybody, um, I'm going to go ahead and read to you something that I found in my files um, that I think y'all might find interesting and also kind of trails on uh, the question that we just received. This is a letter from October 4th of 2010 from the EPA to uh, an attorney who works for a firm that represents waste management. And um, I am going to skip down to the second paragraph. And um, like I said, this is from the EPA. And they wrote, the EPA held a conference call with respondents on September 16th, 2010, to discuss the dispute and to see if a resolution could be had between EPA and respondents. The negotiations became mirrored in discussion by respondents that there are minimal health effects from dioxin and that dioxin is not bad for human consumption. The EPA fundamentally disagrees with this position. The EPA considers dioxin to be highly toxic and dioxin is a listed hazardous substance. 
in light of the polar opposite positions of EPA and respondents with regards to the toxicity of dioxins, negotiations could not proceed past this time. So just a, you know, a reminder that this hasn't always been the easiest relationship, and I don't believe for any reason that it is today an easy relationship. Uh, things have been quite adversarial, always, um, you know, between the different entities involved in this and the different, with the different agencies, with us, with the community groups, community members. Um, and, you know, he, he, here in this letter, it obviously tells us, you know, that that this firm representing one of the responsible parties was trying to get the agency to give them a pass that, you know, this stuff isn't harmful for human consumption. I mean, what, you know, to me, someone who's lived there, like that's just a really a slap in the face. Um, and I think that I came across this at the perfect time in my files because this letter is part of the fundamentals of why we have to continue fighting for this to be done right. Because at the end of the day, the people that are responsible for these sites are trying, you know, every which way to um, have wiggle room to downgrade this site and the toxicity of this site. And um, there's just simply too much at stake. All right, I'll give um, just a little bit more. If anyone wants to unmute themselves, you can click the, your microphone if you're muted would likely be red with a line through it. Um, if you wanna unmute yourself or drop something in the chat before we all log off. Jackie? Yes. I was gonna say that the 160 day extension may have some benefits, but uh, there are two things that concern me. One is that okay. you don't know if they'll ask more time than that after the 160 days. Good point. Good and point. secondly, it's pushing it back far closer to the reconstruction of I-10, and I suspect that's a problem. Right, right. Yep, just getting closer to, yeah, when, when that's gonna take place. Now you're spot on, Gil. Okay, so I think that's an important consideration for, uh, you know, our formal response to the agency is, you know, they can't keep, they, that's what they did in the um, public comment period, is they kept asking for extensions, more extensions, more extensions, and the EPA was like, no, they gave them one or two, and then they were like, no, no more, and so, uh, yeah, we need to point that out and make sure that uh, that's not a trick up their sleeve that they're gonna get away with if it is. All right, folks. Well, thank you for joining us this evening and um, you know giving us your time. And if you missed the previous Zoom conversation, that's where we took a deep dive uh, into the Northern Impoundment. So um, there's some pretty important details there. If you missed that, that's on our YouTube channel. Um, there's a YouTube channel out there that's kind of funky. I don't know who created it, um, but it's not us. Ours has our full name, uh, Texas Health and Environment Alliance Inc. So if you want to find any of our previously recorded community meetings or town halls, um, you can do so at uh, our YouTube channel, which is Texas Health and Environment Alliance Inc. And um, thank you all for joining us again. And I look forward to hopefully seeing y'all in person out in the community sooner rather than later. Thanks y'all, have a good night.